like to introduce Phyllis Saarinen, who will introduce our session for today. And I will also thank everyone for attending this, um, this series of lectures on climate change, what does it mean for civilization? You may wonder, given the title, that what, what, the, how, what we've heard so far has to do anything with civilization. We heard from Dr. Nugent a summary of the trends in weather that are, as in, are interpreted as effects of climate change. We heard from Professor Mullins about the science behind climate change. And we heard from Dr. Mary about efforts to help smallholder farmers in third world countries to adjust to changing rainfall and soil conditions. To my mind, Professor Rosenberg's lecture today is the point of the program. We've seen the destabilizing effect on Europe of mass migrations of refugees from Africa, Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan, contributing to the growth of authoritarian politics in Europe. We've seen the destabilizing effect on Southeast Asia of the migration of a persecuted minority in Myanmar. We've seen the destabilizing effect on our own country of mass migration to the southwestern border by people fleeing the effects of severe drought on food supply, the corruption and violence in their own destabilized Central American countries. We've seen four military coups in just the last year and what some argue was a coup attempt in our own country. This is all not, not in a direct way, but in an in a indirect way, the consequence of changing conditions, conditions that are in part at least affected by climate change. Moreover, social psychologists tell us that people become more violent as the ambient temperature rises. And indeed, the, the murder rate does increase during periods when nighttime temperatures remain high. So these are some of the effects of climate change, effects that have occurred already early in this process. Professor Rosenberg researches and teaches international relations, focusing on race in international politics, human security, and the economic effects of international migration. He applies quantitative techniques to study the illicit and socially undesirable aspects of international politics and political economy. He has a book coming out titled Undesirable Immigrants, Why Racism Persists in International Migration, which unmasks and explains the persistence of racial inequality in international immigration. He received his PhD from Ohio State, a master's in research from London School of Economics, and a BA from the Johns Hopkins University in International Studies and Political Science. Moreover, he is a proud native of Des Moines, Iowa, one of the best cities in the world. And here he is in Gainesville, one of the best cities in the world. Thank you, Dr. Rosenberg. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Phyllis. I really appreciate it. Um, really excited to be here. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and show, uh, share my slides with you all and talk through them. And then at the end of the session, really excited to answer any questions that you might have. And, and so what I was asked to present to you all, um, you know, Phyllis gave me some interesting parameters and I saw the sort of general list of others who were going to speak to you throughout the course of the winter and spring. And, you know, I wanted to integrate what I know about international migration and international politics in general to some of the things that you have already heard this spring, some things that you probably will hear a little bit later on and try to give you a bit of a holistic picture of um, my take on how all of this sort of hangs together. And so I apologize for the first slide uh, because you know Phyllis's wonderful introduction made it a little bit redundant. But again, I really appreciate the introduction. I mean, I really love speaking um, uh, to you know, to groups of people outside the university. It's a really fulfilling aspect of my job. And like I like you all know, I'm Dr. Andrew Rosenberg, and you sort of heard my rap sheet. But the one thing I do want to highlight here is the last bullet point. 
Um, look, I study international politics, but not this, but not the science of climate change. And I don't even really study uh, environmental politics. There's plenty of people throughout the world that do that sort of thing. Um, but I'm going to sort of put my own spin on it, like I said, based on what I know about the politics of the international system and how it dovetails with domestic politics and how that in, will impact, you know, all of us going on in the future. So the roadmap for today is going to sort of have four way stations. The first thing I'm going to talk about is this idea of interdependence and how that relates to international cooperation. Then I'm going to talk about climate migration. Then I'm going to talk about climate change and international conflict. And I'm going to wrap up with some brief thoughts about the future. And like with most things, the future is going to look somewhat like the present, but uh, uh, it's still a little bit ambiguous. So we, maybe we'll have a little bit of fun uh, discussing that later on. The first thing that you hear in all sorts of talks like this uh, is the kind of conventional wisdom that most of us know if you're sitting in a, uh, you know, if, if you're electing to attend a program on climate change or the climate crisis, uh, this won't be uh, this, this won't be very interesting information for you, but I think we can all uh, come to the conclusion based on the scientists that exist at the university that I work at and throughout the world that climate change, however you want to define it, it's a big problem and lots of bizarre things are happening throughout the world. Um, I was reading The New Yorker, uh, I think last weekend, I was reading a previous issue from January 17th about the Great Thaw about how permafrost in places like Siberia is no longer perma nor frost. And there are all sorts of problematic knock-on effects that are taking place due to this uh, non-perma, non-frost uh, uh, sort of becoming exacerbated uh, in, in, in recent years. And it's a bizarre story that's pretty harrowing for a variety of reasons. And if you are so inclined, I would encourage you to go read it because it really, I think, sets the stage nicely for the, the natural context. And when I say natural, I mean the natural world context that I'm talking about here. You know, we're not, we're not, we're not talking about graphs that show temperature going up, or we're not showing, I'm not talking about graphs that show the number of species going down. I mean, I'm literally showing you a picture that you know, it's from the New Yorker of this horse eating frost or I guess formerly frosted land that had been there for, you know, hundreds of thousands of years. So given this natural scientific background, you might ask yourself, well, why the hell should you listen to a political scientist about any of this? Um, who cares about what I have to say other than the fact that I went to school for a really long time? And quite frankly, that would be a great question. Uh, and Whenever I tell people, you know, people in my family, friends, and so on, why they should listen to me about basically anything, I tell them, well, politics is pretty ubiquitous. It's just the study or the, uh, the process of deciding who gets what, where, when, why, and how. And as you might imagine, that applies to a variety of things. And I contend that that's, that definition of politics is really important for thinking through the, the climate crisis, both in its causes and its effects. Now, with that brush cleared somewhat, hopefully, here's the big takeaway from today. And now this takeaway doesn't just apply to climate change. You know, I like the framing of this sort of lecture series as climate change and its effects on civilization, because I think this concept of interdependence is something that we can apply not just to climate change, but to sort of international politics and politics in general. And my, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know if I would call this controversial, but one of my uh, hobby horses, I guess, is to proclaim that the most important concept in international relations, both the discipline, you know, where I come from, capital I, capital R international relations, as well as the actual international relations that exist out there outside my window is this concept of interdependence. And 
I really apologize for the jargon. Um, it's never fun to uh, uh, learn nonsense words like this uh, or to try to keep them to keep them in your head. But I, I really think there's a lot of value from leaning on these theoretical concepts that come from my world of academic IR because it just applies so nicely and so naturally to the world that we, we actually inhabit. And when I think of interdependence though, it has a pretty straightforward definition. The basic idea is that actors, states, people, dogs, species, whatever, were linked in our world such that the actions or decisions that I make or that Taiwan makes uh, uh, affects the decisions and actions of other states, other people, other species, and so on. And the easiest way to think about what interdependence actually means is by thinking through what globalization means. This is the natural way to think about an interdependent international system. And naturally, the world is very connected in 2022. Uh, it's much more connected than it was in 1922 or 1722 or 1522. States, people, and so on are more connected today than they have ever been due to a variety of reasons. And I think the last six months or 12 months, or I guess you know, going back two years, have really shown us this. But if you, if you, if you follow the news, you'll know that something like a temporary shutdown of a port in China can affect the price of Christmas ornaments in Chattanooga. Uh, insert your favorite example of this sort of uh, a butterfly effect here. And thinking about interdependence can help us understand most of politics because the fact that people, countries, governments, species are so interconnected it means that a lot of our most pressing problems can't just be solved really simply. And even though the fact of interdependence makes thinking about some of these problems a bit of a bleak proposition, I think really the only way to address them is to sort of uh, take this interdependence head on. And because not only do we live on a planet where we have uh, interdependent states and peoples and governments, but we also have interdependent uh, organisms and uh, climate systems. Uh, this naturally extends to uh, climate change and uh, its relationship to politics, international and otherwise. So the reason why people like me talk about interdependence is because of its really tight link to international cooperation. And as you might imagine, or you might remember from things that you've read or other classes you've taken or, or, or what have you, the idea in international politics is that international cooperation among states is really hard because there's no world government. You know, regardless of what some people say about the United Nations or what have you, that's not a world government par excellence. Because you know, I live in the United States, I live in sunny Gainesville. If somebody breaks into my house, then I can call the cops. And I have some sort of authority sitting on top of me, a government, a local state and national government that can adjudicate things if somebody breaks into my house. The problem in international politics is that there are no cops. And this fact of non-copness, the fact that no cops exist in the international system, is what international relations like myself call anarchy. And now that's a really fraught term and really complicated and there's lots of debates, but this is basically what we call anarchy. And the problem of anarchy is that it limits cooperation. Countries have to look after themselves. You know, if I, if I uh, lived in a place where there was no police, then I would have to take lots of different measures to ensure that I would be able to take care of myself in our you know, society where people might wanna do bad things to me. That's the sort of natural analogy from uh, a city where there are no police to an international system where there's no world government. And because states have to look after themselves, it's much harder to get them to come together and cooperate. The nice thing about interdependence, the nice thing that states are connected to each other, 
is that this helps cooperation in many circumstances. Because if we're all in the same boat, if we're all facing similar problems, then it's much, and we all have knowledge that we all face the same problems, then that means that we can come together to solve problems, or at least do a much better job than solving problems than I don't know, somebody like Thomas Hobbes envisioned you know, back in the 17th century. Now, this has been a lot of preamble, so you might be wondering, how does this apply, how does this apply to climate change? Well, as perhaps the first three speakers have said, talked about the consensus. Um, this is from a, an article in the scientific journal Nature that I that I pulled a little while ago. You know, within fifty mil, uh, within fifty years, the consensus more or less is that somewhere from one to three billion people on planet Earth are projected to be left outside the climate conditions that have served humanity well for the past six thousand years. Now those climate conditions have a really precise uh, uh, definition. And so you know, see another expert for what that actually means. But the basic idea is that climate change is coming for all of us. But most of these people, most of these one to three billion people will be located in the global south. And when I talk about the global south as opposed to the global north where we live, I'm talking about basically everywhere outside of uh, uh, the United States, Canada, Western Europe, Japan, Australia, places like that. The Global South, Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia, and so on. And this has really important implications for how we think about climate change and its uneven, but still vast effects on humanity. And yeah, like I said, climate change affects everyone. But it's really easy to talk about climate change affecting everyone worldwide, you know, in, in scare quotes, whatever that means. But the really important extension of that is that the climate, the effects of climate change also affect everyone. So we're, uh, we're in this really complicated situation where something like drought in sub-Saharan Africa can lead to crop failures, precarity, and mass emigration, and these people want to go somewhere else. And that somewhere else might be within their own country, within a country in the region that they're living in, or somewhere in the global north like Europe, the United States, Canada, and so on. And that fact of the connection between these sort of large trends in uh, climate change having broad effects that are unevenly distributed, but still affect places where the effects aren't seen really drastically, like, I don't know, where I'm from in Des Moines, Iowa, or something like that. The fact that all of this is tied together makes this problem really complicated. And I like to look at the case of Zimbabwe to really drive this, to, to drive this point home, but also to sort of lead us into a more detailed discussion of what I've just been talking about. Look, in Zimbabwe, up to 70% of people make a living from agriculture or other related rural activities. And that's a massive percentage. And an implication of this is that these 70% of people depend entirely on rain to water their crops. You know, it's subsistence agriculture in, in, in many respects. The problem is that in Zimbabwe and elsewhere in the region, average temperatures have risen about one degree Celsius, which you know might not seem like a lot, but when you're talking about global climate change in our environment that's been steady more or less for you know uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of years, I mean this is a really big deal. Um, unsurprisingly, accompanying this rise in temperatures has been a decrease in annual rainfall by twenty to thirty percent. And this decrease in rainfall over time has led to massive droughts the most recent of which took place in 2018 to 2020. And that 20 to 30% decrease in rainfall is massive. I mean, again, because we're all human beings, it can be hard for us to conceptualize what uh, these, a lot of these numbers mean, but that 20 to 30% is significant enough to lead to a drought that lasted, you know, the better part of three plus years. And it was so dire, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't just like a small drought, you know, this was a significant drought that affected a massive amount of the, 
population of this country. And it was so bad that some people were, had to resort to eating you know, leaves and virtually inedible powdery fruit on baobab trees. I mean, it was really, really dire stuff. Because of this, thousands and thousands of Zimbabweans fled to the Eastern Highlands regions of this country. And turns out when thousands of people migrate from uh, being diffused throughout the country to being concentrated in one single part of the country, this has really strained resources and led to many social problems. Because of these social problems, this has also led pre to pressure to move abroad. And here's where we get the real crux of the story here. And I you know, previewed this a little bit earlier. And please forgive the watermark on this cartoon. Um, I, didn't, uh, I didn't feel like paying $15.99 for it or whatever. But, but when, when we put climate migration in, into context with what we've heard about migration from uh, uh, previous civil wars or previous global con, con, uh, conflicts, the conventional wisdom is that things that we've seen before in the, uh, in the name of uh, refugee flows from global and even local conflicts is represented, you know, by the left-hand panel of the screen, you know, refugees moving abroad because they've been displaced. The right-hand side of the screen ultimately is what many people think our future is going to look like. Because, and you'll see this in a second, the scope and the impact of climate change, not just in Zimbabwe, but throughout the global south is going to be that much bigger. Naturally, as you have undoubtedly seen elsewhere, um, uh, this may not be that big of a problem, but people in a variety of countries, for several reasons, uh, aren't too keen on massive numbers of people entering their countries as refugees, regardless of how noble or how uh, precarious their individual circumstances might be. We've seen a, we've seen a lot of anti-immigrant violence uh, in Turkey, which is, you know, situated uh, between the Middle East and Europe, such that they've really borne the brunt of a lot of uh, uh, mass migration movements from uh, things like the Syrian civil war. Um, and people, uh, you know, colleagues of mine who study international migration and its effect on domestic politics in places like Europe have studied this explicitly. And a variety of evidence has come out in the last decade that shows that exposure to the refugee crisis and to refugees and other immigrants more generally causes native citizens of those countries to become more hostile. And so you can sort of start piecing together the problem, right? We have climate change, it's gonna affect lots of people, particularly in the, in the global South and people in the West, people in places like Greece, other areas of Europe, United States and so on, have been particularly uh, uh, inhospitable or unwilling to see these people enter their political community. But you should realize that this is not just a global north, Western European, Australian, American problem. This is a problem within the global south as well. We've seen lots of violence and lots of unrest within the global south due to these mass migrations that have been spurred on, not just by uh, climate change, but also due to things like drought or due to things like civil war. And, uh, you know, South Africa is one of the paradigmatic cases, but you see anti-immigrant sentiment, anti-refugee sentiment uh, th throughout the global South. And so this is not just a um, uh, Western country bad type of an argument or a type of explanation. This is something that takes place throughout the world. It's something that everybody contends with. So where are we so far? We've talked about how climate change causes droughts and other extreme weather events which leads to refugees to which natives in many countries are quite hostile. And to put a uh, really blunt point on it, this is a big problem because the most precarious people in the world already, irrespective of saying anything about drought or other climate related issues, these are already the most precarious people and they're the ones who are the most harmed. 
And uh, here's where here's where some of the dire part of the story kicks in a little bit. It's not obvious that things will get better because people already don't like refugees, as I was just discussing. And the potential for climate refugees far outstrips what we've seen this century in every other refugee movement basically put together. We've seen 6.8 uh, displaced refugees following the Syrian civil war. And that might seem like a really big number, and of course it is. We saw approximately 11 million uh, uh, displaced persons following the Second World War, and wow, that's you know nearly double the number of the sort of contemporary uh, refugee crisis that we've heard so much about. And you might ask yourself, well, what is the potential for climate refugees? You know, what do scholars think is a a reasonable ballpark number, you know, 11 million, that seems like a lot, 6.8 million, that's a lot, and we've already seen its effects uh, throughout the world. Well, this is, a, this is an article uh, from a couple of years ago from The Guardian, and uh, uh, there have been several reports that estimate that uh, cl the climate crisis, depending on how severe it is, could displace up to 1.2 billion people by 2050. So look, 1.2 billion with a B compared to 11 million following the Second World War. You know, one of the one of the great uh, uh, horrific crises in the history of uh, uh, you know the post 1648 international system. So we're talking about a massive, massive, massive difference in scale. You know, to be sure, 6.8 million refugees following the Syrian civil war. That's a huge problem, but this is a whole other kettle of fish. So here's what we've learned so far. Interdependence is a fundamental feature of our modern world. Hopefully I was able to uh, uh, convince you of that in the early part of the lecture. The second thing is that interdependence affects international cooperation. Now I haven't talked about that so much with regards to climate change, but that's coming. But I at least previewed this for you. Interdependence affects international cooperation because even though we live in an anarchic world in which there's no government, you know, world government, it's a lot harder for states to come together to cooperate. Uh, the fact that interdependence exists, the fact that countries realize that they're in the same boat in certain circumstances, that can lead to cooperation. And three is that climate change poses perhaps the most serious crisis of interdependence uh, in the history of humankind via, for example, as we just heard, uh, climate migration. Now, as you might expect, or you might be surprised to hear, um, this interdependence crisis, as I call it, actually has created or led to quite a lot of cooperation among states. And, um, uh, you know, some people at face value think this is a good thing. However, unlike many other areas of international politics, this cooperation is not the typical type of cooperation that most scholars think about. You know, when most scholars think about international cooperation, they think about things like alliances, trade deals, I don't know, cooperation on uh, tourism or education, like you see um, some places in Europe. You know, these are the positive types of cooperation. For about, I don't know, 70 odd years, uh, if you took an introduction to international relations class or an international relations PhD seminar, you would hear about cooperation as being kind of an unqualified good thing. But um, uh, the cooperation that we've seen with regards to climate change in our particular moment of interdependence crisis uh, hasn't actually been so good. This is actually one area in which international cooperation has uh, led to the harm of thousands and thousands of people. And so it's a bit counterintuitive for lots of people to hold these ideas in their head. The fact that interdependence leads to cooperation, but that cooperation that many of us have equated with good things like, I don't know, nuclear non-proliferation treaties 
or bilateral investment treaties or the creation of the World Bank. In this case, in the most acute case of climate change, um, successes in this type of cooperation have actually led to quite a lot of harm. And I think uh, because uh, I like to repeat myself, that's a lot, that's a lot what is going to be on this slide as well. International relations scholarship tells us that interdependent states are much more likely to cooperate. That's usually good. Hooray. Um, but in the case of climate migration, this has actually led to further humanitarian crises. Now, I'm not talking about uh, uh, the Paris Accords or uh, other international co uh, climate change cooperation initiatives like the INF, uh, PCCC, or, or, or what have you. I'm talking about how states come together to cooperate to restrict migrants and refugees. And what they typically do is outsource migration and refugee problems to other states, which continues to create sharp divides in which countries have to deal with these problems more than others. So what the European Union will do, and I'm going to talk about this in a second, what they'll do is they'll outsource their policing of the refugee crisis to countries like Libya, who will be emboldened to intercept migrant ships and detain people. And what a lot of people call this in the sort of pessimistic uh, literature on the European Union is liberal fortress Europe, where we see the European Union talking about these great uh, liberal values of uh, human rights and democracy and equality, but doing so by uh, erecting big walls on their borders to keep everybody out and uh, shunted into areas of the global south where you know they're disappeared or uh, detained indefinitely. And most people contend that this is likely going to get more pronounced as climate migration increases because of some of the issues that we've talked about earlier. Because Western populations are uh, so uh, uh, reticent to see increases in refugee or immigrant populations, there's going to be greater pressure on their elected and unelected officials to come up with these sorts of agreements with countries like Libya to make sure that the climate refugee problem doesn't come here. It stays in the global south. And of course, that's going to lead to further inequality. One of the key uh, examples of this has been the EU-Libya deal from 2016. And there's been a lots of, at least in the last year, five-year retrospectives on the effects that the EU-Libya deal has had. And the basic idea here is that the European Union doesn't want uh, uh, mass refugee, mass waves of refugees like they saw in 2015 from occurring anymore. And so what the European Union did was provide boatloads of funding and support to not just the Libyan Coast Guard, but to the Libyan government. And what that does is emboldens Libya to intercept boats, disembark people, uh, ship them places, and detain them indefinitely. Now, the key here is that this is technically unlawful. It's technically unlawful for, uh, uh, for the European Union to, let's see, do I put, no. It's technically unlawful to, for the U European Union to allow Libya to disembark people and send them back to places where they have fear of being persecuted, which many of them have been in Libya, but uh, this has not been adjudicated in international law. And, um, you know, because I guess I'm the world's biggest fan of The New Yorker, uh, you might be interested in this article from the December, 20, uh, the, the December 6th, 2021 issue about these secret prisons that have been keeping migrants out of Europe since the EU-Libya deal was struck in 2016. And, you know, it's not light reading, it's not happy reading, but it definitely puts faces and hyper specifics on uh, this sort of broad sort of this broad conceptual story that I've been talking about and that maybe you've been, been, been hearing about in the news. Now, 
migration, to be sure, even though it's the thing that I uh, study most of all, it's not the only aspect of the climate crisis that's going to affect world politics. And this is something that Phyllis previewed in her comments earlier. Uh, climate change also affects conflict both between and within states. And because conflict is something that international relations scholars have been studying for as long, you know, since, uh, I don't know, Thucydides or something like that, uh, this is naturally something that uh, many of us have started to work quite a bit on. And I will say that not only is this an equally, as equally of a pressing issue as climate migration, that these things actually go together. And uh, in a story, in a lecture about interdependence and globalization, this should probably be pretty unsurprising. And I think what I'm going to do is probably put a little bit more specific color on that story that uh, Phyllis was alluding to early on. And there's been a lot of work on how changes in temperatures and precipitation patterns increase the risk of conflict both between and within states. One, uh, one good example is a study that uh, uh, shows that every one degree Celsius increase in temperature increases conflict between individuals within states, for example, assault, murder, so on, by 2.4%, which is a, you know, a really significant increase. You've seen in the last six months uh, a lot of hand wringing in certain uh, aspects of the news media about increases in uh, the assault rate in certain American cities by uh, less than this amount, you know, 1.5% or so on. It also shows that every one degree Celsius increase in temperature increases conflict between groups, such as, you know, riots, civil war in states by 11.3%. So we're not just talking about significant increases in assaults, we're talking about even larger, more significant increases in the likelihood of things like riots and civil war. And yes, these are very, very, very big numbers. And I always like to uh, uh, stick with, you know, the, the, the same sorts of examples whenever I get a talk. And so let's talk for a few minutes before we wrap up about climate and con, you know, climate change and conflict in Africa. Because as I alluded to earlier, or I explicitly said earlier, this is very closely related to climate migration. And one example, going back to that African case, is the conflicts that have emerged between nomadic herders and farmers. And you should be thinking about the Zimbabwe case, you know, thinking about that Zimbabwe case where climate change often leads to drought, which uh, uh, in which during droughts, not enough plants grow naturally to feed the herds or livestock during the, of, of livestock during the wet season, which causes serious problems because if you're a nomadic herder, your livelihood is keeping uh, a, your, your herd alive and happy. What herders are then forced to do, therefore, is to migrate to farmers' lands before the dry season begins. And look, uh, in Iowa, we have an expression that goes something like, you know, they don't make more land. And that's definitely true. And the fact that herders are moving to the lands of more entrenched farmers leads to disputes, overcrowding, competition for scarce resources. Um, and whenever you have competition for scarce resources, you have the potential for conflict that can ultimately spill into bigger conflicts, which can ultimately spill into further pressures for climate migration. This has gotten so acute that uh, basically a year ago, uh, the UN Secretary General called climate change a quote, crisis multiplier with profound implications for international peace and security. And when somebody like me, who's read a lot of speeches by people like UN security, Secretary Generals, whenever you start hearing about multipliers or crisis multipliers, you know, your antenna uh, should be popping up because this isn't, uh, this isn't just rhetorical uh, sugar. You know, this is something that uh, is actually something that we need to pay close attention to. And in my field, people do these uh, really interesting uh, modeling exercise exercises where they try to predict the general 
the general risk of armed conflict, both within countries, within regions, and within the globe in general. And some people in my field have estimated that climate change, or if you want to call it climate variability, has influenced between 3% and 20% of all of the excess risk in armed conflict over the past 100 years. And of course, we're not talking about uh, the climate crisis being 100 years old necessarily. What we're saying here is that variations in climate, uh, variations in climate change, whether small or large, those variations over the last 100 years have accounted for nearly a quarter of the risk of armed conflict in the international system over the past 100 years. So it's a little bit of a, a, subtle, a subtle way of thinking about it there. But what you should realize is at, at the systemic level, changes in temperature, changes in climate, climate variability matters a lot. And in many situations can matter more than lots of the things that you might think should lead to armed conflict risk uh, uh, throughout the world. And unsurprisingly, uh, this risk, this excess armed conflict risk typically uh, relates to the risk of terrorism or other armed insurgencies. What a, re a recent example from Afghanistan has shown that reduced harvest due to climate variability has pushed people into poverty which leads them, which leaves them susceptible to recruitment by armed groups. So this recruitment by armed groups in many cases is not necessarily ideological. It's because people have been impoverished. And so this is a, a, a pretty sad story. Whenever you have uh, increased recruitment by armed groups, I don't have, uh, you know, it doesn't take uh, somebody with a PhD to realize that this is likely to raise the likelihood for intra and inter state conflict as uh, those armed groups do things and are prevented from doing things uh, uh, by other countries in the international system. Naturally, uh, uh, the future prospects for this aren't particularly uh, uh, optimistic and because as this climate variability is set to increase, this should get progressively worse. Um, so another, I guess, another happy gloss on this interdependence uh, crisis story. To be sure, um, things aren't all bad. I guess that maybe I don't want to put it that way. Um, I, I guess I like how I put it on the slide here. This is not necessarily a causal panacea. Climate change surely leads to particularly bad security outcomes in some places, some places in Sub-Saharan Africa, some places like in Afghanistan, but we don't see it causing particularly bad security outcomes in other places. And for somebody like me, this puzzle of why it causes uh, bad problems in some places rather than others is kind of an interesting question. And of course, naturally more work needs to be done on this and will be done on this inevitably as climate change becomes more, more pronounced. Um, but one book that I will flag for you, if this is something that you're interested in, and uh, the book isn't out yet, but uh, it's called States in Nature, The Effects of Climate Change on Security by a guy named Joshua W. Busby. Uh, he's at the University of Texas. Uh, is coming out and it's going to explicitly dig into uh, uh, this variation in uh, uh, climate related conflict outcomes, dig into some of these mechanisms. And, you know, he's an actual expert on climate conflict and, you know, you can uh, sort of get stuck into this book to your heart's desire if you're, uh, if, if you're so inclined. But, you know, there's plenty of really interesting resources out there on uh, climate change and its relationship to international migration. Uh, but this one I think is coming out in May and you know, might be worth uh, pre-ordering if, if you're so inclined. It, of course, it'll be, uh, it'll be a sort of laced with some academic ease, uh, but, but, but he's a pretty clear writer. So, so you might be interested in this. So some of you might be thinking, well, we've talked about uh, uh, how climate change influences international and uh, domestic conflicts. And you might be thinking, well, won't this make the climate migration problems a lot worse? 
And of course, the answer is yes, because when you're talking about inter uh, interdependence in the international system, particularly as it relates to, to climate change, uh, the, the, the new boss is the same as the old boss. Things typically uh, spiral and get worse in situations like this. And yes, this is in fact one of the definitions of an interdependence crisis. Uh, the past affects the present, which affects the future sort of in a cyclical fashion. And I'll talk about that you know, when I conclude in a second. But what you should be thinking about anytime when you're you know, reading something in the news or watching something on TV about this, you always need to think about how climate change has multiple effects, each of which have knock-on effects that affect each other, particularly as we move on into the future. Climate change leads to conflict, which leads to migration. This migration, because people don't really like uh, uh, climate refugees, leads to increased pressure for more barriers to movement, which leads to more desperation as people get stuck in places they don't wanna be or they feel um, uh, threatened, which leads to more conflict, which is, and, and you can see how uh, you can see how the circle sort of goes on and how this could be exacerbated as climate change becomes worse and worse. And the bottom line is climate change, its severity and its knock on effects are going to lead to uh, many aspects of international and domestic politics changing and being required to react uh, in the future. The problem though, and uh, you know, this is where people who study politics sort of start thinking a little bit like engineers. The problem, though, is if you have a complex interdependent system, you can't just think about solving one of these problems because the only way to solve one of these problems is to solve another problem, which is to solve another problem, is to solve another problem. So we can't solve any of these problems really without trying to wrap our arms around all of these problems at the same time. And that sounds kind of hard, which, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it is definitely hard, but uh, that's, why, that's why knowledge of the problem that we face, I think is quite, quite important. And look, the tendency for lots of people is to be sad about this and sure, I mean, it's a natural inclination to think that you're sort of on a runaway freight train and you know, with the, uh, I don't know if trains still have those things that you pull to, to break them, but you know, at least they did in the 19th century. Um, look, you know, we, we, could be, we could be depressed about this, um, but I think even though we face a very dire crisis of interdependence with the climate crisis in international and domestic politics, we can start to think about ways to alleviate some of these issues because we might not be able to solve any of these issues completely either in isolation or as a totality, but we can think about uh, sort of palliative care, if you wanna think about it that way. We can think about true multinational international cooperation on this. We can think about vast amounts of aid such that we can alleviate those most in peril in the countries from which they come. You know, we can think about massive aid packages to the global south and direct transfers to people in the global south to try to prevent things from to, to prevent those sort of local conflicts from spilling into national conflicts, from spilling into international conflicts that catalyze these migration flows. But look, this is just me spitballing. Um, I don't have all the answers if you couldn't tell already. But of course, this doesn't solve the domestic politics problem either within sort of highly populated countries in the global South or in places like the United States um, because people will still not be amenable to seeing influxes of refugees into their country. I mean, we see this today. We, see, we saw this in the 1930s. I mean, this is just a, a, a persistent problem throughout uh, modern history, you know, sort of modern post 17th century history in the international system. Um, and really the only way to address that problem is to radically reconsider the nature of political communities, which also sounds like a bigger problem to solve in some of these other things, because in modern states, in our current international system, uh, we have this conventional wisdom that holds that we don't really have much of a duty to help desperate outsiders 
Um, people that live in our country have higher moral worth than people outside of our country because of things like borders and the nature of sovereignty in the international system. And unless we can address that problem, uh, uh, this domestic politics problem isn't going to be alleviated either. So look, more problems and more people are on the way. And uh, I think it behooves all of us to you know, think seriously and think carefully about uh, where we are, where we've been, but most importantly, uh, where we're going. Because, you know, interdependence is a fundamental fact of human life. Climate change is a fundamental fact of modern human life. And um, the only way to address it is to not shirk from it. So thank you very much. I really appreciate your, uh, your attention. Um, I'm really excited to, uh, to hear more about uh, what you have to say and to potentially uh, ask any questions, answer any questions you might have. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Professor Rosenberg. That gives us a great deal to think about. Um, I really appreciate your comments and how, uh, how well you have, have expressed and enlightened us. Oh. Um, so um, I, do we have, please raise your hand on the panel on the right hand side of your screen if you have questions. Uh, meanwhile, we have one question already in the chat line um, oh, yeah, from uh, Ellen Siegel, who was our last wrap up uh, speaker for the program, I might add. Uh, from your point of view, lacking a world government, is there any international organization that's looking at this from a migration perspective? UN, World Bank, UNFCC, World Economic Forum, Political Scientists Without Borders, LOL. <laughs> As a concerned citizen, any suggestion for what we individuals can do? Oh, th thanks for the great question, Ellen. Um, you know, there's a couple, there's sort of a couple of questions in there. Um, so the UNFCC is certainly um, a place where some of these issues are uh, uh, debated, but I think you'll find that uh, uh, institutions like the World Bank uh, the World Economic Forum and the UN are really um, where a lot of, uh, and, and also things like the International Organization for Migration. That's, um, those, these are sort of, I guess not in the case of the UN, but um, sort of more specific targeted organizations that are looking at the causes and effects of certain aspects of this causal chain that I've been talking about. So the World Bank, uh, is really interested in how they can fund local sort of national level programs in places like, I don't know, Uzbekistan or Zimbabwe or whatever, to try to build up local resistance to hopefully uh, alleviate some of these local problems. Um, so, uh, you know, I would encourage you to, uh, uh, to look at some of the really interesting programs that, that, that the bank is doing. And, you know, I, um, I have some experience working with them on, uh, projects uh, uh, on human trafficking, um, but also, um, uh, uh, you know, but, but also the International Organization for Migration, because they really have lots of very interesting data and lots of policy reports that can allow you to sort of sink your teeth into some of these more specifics um, if you're so inclined. And to the last point about, you know, concerned citizens, any suggestions for what we individuals can do? Um, yeah, this is the really difficult question, right? Because, um, you know, in the last 50 years, um, I don't know, this might be, you know, of course, this, this is my opinion and does not reflect the, uh, uh, the views, values, or beliefs of my employer. Um, but I think what you've seen a lot in the discourse about climate change um, in the last 50 years has been to shift the onus onto individuals to do things like separate the recycling into orange and blue bins or whatever. And if you do that, you can reduce your carbon footprint and solve climate change. And, you know, I think um, uh, in the absence of actual real structural change or uh, 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 the initiative taken by these sort of international bodies and powerful countries like the United States, and so on, no, nothing's gonna ever change. I mean, no amount of me recycling uh, is going to uh, uh, allow, is, is gonna force the European Union to you know, tear up the, the Libya deal and to think 
much more carefully about the relationship between insiders and outsiders and how they relate to their publics and so on and so forth. And so really, um, as concerned citizens, I think it's important to be informed, but also to inform your friends and family members and to point them to resources that are, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, teched up on all of these more pressing challenges, because the only way I think to catalyze change going forward is to uh, you know, teach and inform others and to vote. And that's not a very satisfying answer, I realize. But, you know, as of right now, that's the sort of the best that I uh, can come up with. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, let's go on to Anne-Marie Rizzo. Thank you. Um, you caught me answering the door. Um, uh, thank you so much for this presentation because uh, it touched on so many um, points that I see neglected in uh, contemporary or mainstream media these days, which of course isn't very uh, long term in its view of what problems need to be addressed. Um, I guess as a political scientist, you probably um, risk having nightmares following the local news or the national news. But I, I keep wondering from your point of view, um, how it is you think that um, discussion about these issues ought to be raised um, by journalists, by the media in a way that is going to reach the American public. And the reason I say that is because I'm all too familiar with uh, NIMBY thinking not in my backyard thinking in the United States and certainly some of the more um, conservative laissez-faire um, points of view regarding um, how people ought to be regarding what their interests are. All right, so it's all about self-interest and this is not just limited to the United States. There's certainly a lot of that perspective um, in Western Europe as well. Uh, but I'm wondering, you know, how do you see this subject being brought up in a way that is going to reach Americans so that um, people begin to shift their perspectives on this? And I wondered if you had any thoughts about that. Oh, absolutely. That's a really, that's a fantastic question. I really appreciate it because it, um, I don't know, there's, there's lots of really interesting pieces of that that I can latch on to. So, I don't know. I, I mean, we're in the United, or I, I presume we're all in the United States. I mean, uh, let's let's say we are for the sake of argument. I mean, we're all in the United States and we're in a very bizarre situation being the, you know, one of the largest, most powerful, most influential countries in the world, but also having, when compared to our uh, uh, sort of, we'll call them colleagues in the developed world, in the U European Union, the United Kingdom, Australia, and so on, we're sort of unique in that um, one of our major political parties, um, for the most part, trades on climate skepticism and climate denial. And look, like, um, uh, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I, I you know, I, I can't look you all in the eyes, and so I can't see if anybody's rolling their eyes at me. But um, uh, irrespective of how you feel about that. Um, in this country, the discourse lags quite a bit behind the discourse in other places like in Europe where the conventional wisdom and not just the conventional wisdom among, you know, half of the political spectrum is that climate change is a real thing and it's causing actual problems because until you can get that far, then you're going to have a hard time talking about basically anything else, right? And so, it, it, you know, if you watch, I don't know, when I'm at home, when I go home at 5.30 tonight or whatever, I'm going to turn on uh, Fox 51 News or whatever, like the local Orlando news. And I don't know, the nice people on there, you know, might have a climate story. And if you sort of notice, not just in Florida, not just in Orlando, but, but throughout the country, if you notice, um, there's always this sort of both sidesism on climate and ecological issues where um, uh, they'll, they'll raise something where some people think it's climate change. Other people think it's, you know, just random. And we just have this, so the conventional wisdom in America, if you look at America as a totality, is that this is still up for debate. And I think until we can address that, we can't address any of the other stuff. And um, 
that's a really hard problem to solve too, as long as political benefits can be gained from people running on climate skepticism. And look, we live in a, we live in a democracy and I don't really know what to do about that. You know, um, democracy is the best or is the worst form of government other than all of the other ones, right? I mean, didn't Winston Churchill say that? Um, so we live in a, we live in a, you know, we have a great form of government that also has problematic aspects to it. And um, if this was other countries that um, uh, didn't have permissive free speech laws, you know, we would outlaw climate skepticism, but we're obviously not going to do that. And so I think um, uh, uh, journalists actually do an okay job of this, trying to ask the right questions, but the incentives are such that um, so long as politicians can gain currency running on climate skepticism, it's going to be really difficult. Um, so the um, so so that's the first thing I wanted to say. Um, the second thing. Um, so the second thing is sort of a um, a, mo a more global problem that that relates to that. So even though so you might so you might say okay well. Dr. Rosenberg in Sweden, they think climate change is a thing, um, but there's still, you know, uh, intense anti-immigrant sentiment there. Or in Greece, you know, uh, they they really hate refugees from the Syrian civil war. So how are we going to solve that? I mean, really, um, uh, uh, I don't know. I think really the only thing to be done from the perspective of uh, uh, journalists in the media is to highlight how um, the problems that I've been talking about today are linked together. For example, even if you live in a society where climate skepticism is pervasive, you can still show very conclusively that, for instance, uh, an increase or uh, droughts cause conflict. And so perhaps, you know, if you're thinking particularly optimistically, you can sidestep the climate you know, the man-made climate change aspect of it and just skip right to the, the part of the causal chain when you're discussing the relationship between drought, conflict, migration to see if you can be a little bit more utilitarian about addressing aspects up the chain. And I realized, you know, there was a lot more to your question there, but um, that was me trying to sort of speak to certain aspects of it. I, I, I hope I did an okay job. All right, thank you. Um by the way, on, we do dude. have one. We do have one uh, international social scientist scholar here from Finland as part oh, of our uh, guest list. Uh, Richard Petway, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, very stimulating and wide scope. I'd like to go back to an early comment you made about no policeman. Oh, sure. Uh, in other words, it seemed to me to as a cynic. Uh, you could say, well, uh, the only thing, only thing that politicians would agree to would be something that they could sign, um, like the law of the sea that has, uh, even though it has the keg as uh, the court to decide matters uh, that are violations of the law of the sea, um, the Philippines took uh, China uh, to the World Court, um, saying they were interfering with their uh, rights to fish in the South China Sea, and uh, the Hague uh, ruled uh, for the Philippines against China. And of course, China says, oh, you know, I ignore that, you know, and went on and uh, nothing happened. So I, I wonder uh, if the uh, having no policeman is a purposeful way for politicians to agree to something. Uh, trade uh, comes to mind, certainly uh, treaties like the Law of the Sea, the UN sponsored uh, motions. So I'd like for you to kind of say that maybe uh, finding a policeman would be more difficult um, and we wouldn't get the treaties that would be passed by the willing. Um, uh, but that's a cynical view, perhaps. But it, it also might be true. 
No, no, I, I, so I don't think it's a cynical view at all. I mean, I think it's a view that, you know, 99% of international relations scholars would agree to. I mean, they, they would probably say, look, you know, what you describe is uh, a natural fact of international politics. Um, in the 17th century and a little bit before, um, for various reasons, uh, this idea of state sovereignty emerged and that coalesced into the rise of the nation state in sort of the 19th century. And we live in this world of uh, nation states now. And really the only way to get anything done is to, as you put it, not have a policeman. And so I don't, I think, um, I think we're definitely, I think we're definitely in an agreement there. Um, what somebody, you know, the, the aspect of that that is a little, I, I think it's a little bit orthogonal to the points that you, were, you would make is that the, the basic contention in sort of an international relations 101 class is that um, uh, if, I don't know, uh, if, if China invaded the Philippines, the Philippines couldn't call on like a UN army to come save them or whatever. And so, so this framing of the lack of the international police force basically gets back to some of the uh, foundational stuff in international relations coming after the Second World War, sort of theorizing about what the inter how the international system differs from domestic politics. But I think you're spot on in the case of, uh, you know, getting things done and being something that politicians could, could agree on. Well, the following World War II, the US has been the world cop, uh, you know, even though at the same time, we uh, ourselves have been um, violating the international peace, shall we say, by invading Iraq well, we pick our spots, the action right? in like Vietnam. That. Yeah, so, exactly. Uh, Bob Bernstein, you have a question. Bob Bernstein, unmute, please. Y yes, um, it's great to see a different, uh, such a different brain working than uh, my my science brain. I I, I love that. Um, you you refer to uh, particularly uh, to Zimbabwe and other African countries, but the the problems also are right in our back door. I mean, I, I can't help thinking as you were talking of the case of Central American countries where crops are failing because of climate change and they're trying to migrate, but there's then there's the political problems of those countries in Mexico and the US. But you say you can't solve one of the problems without solving all the problems. I, I, it boggles my mind how you would, how you would solve this and solving the the climate change problems is decades or maybe even centuries of work. Is there an order in which you might approach, best approach those problems? I mean, it almost seems like the quickest solutions could be political. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Bob, I, I, I appreciate it. Right. On my part, I admit. No, no. Um, I don't know. I guess the, the nice thing about having uh, countries or, or governments is that you can sort of multitask a little bit. And I think, I think you're right. I mean, political, political solutions. So what some people would view as a solution, others would view as like a complete travesty. So if you're, if, if you, you know, look, maybe you and I are of the same mind of the nature of the problem and the nature of potential solutions, but that doesn't mean that an opponent of ours on uh, uh, somewhere else in the, uh, 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 the parameter space of policy positions might not think that we're like going to completely destroy the fabric of society with the things that we think are political solutions. And so, um, I think, uh, I, I honestly think that all the problems associated with climate change are often just more acute versions of the political debates and political problems that we've been dealing with, you know, for hundreds of years. And so, 
I don't know. So that's why on the one hand, I'm uh, you know, pessimistic about solving lots of these things, but at least one reason to be at least in part optimistic is that, you know, we've made progress in a lot of ways on a lot of fronts. And so maybe a piecemeal approach can at least alleviate some of these problems. Thank you. The, um, the uh, philosopher Timothy Morton has written extensively about the idea of the hyper object. And in fact, the film Don't Look Up is about a, this political social response to, a, to an event or, or a hyper object so, in, so all encompassing that you can't react to it. Right. And so there are some people who equate that to climate change. Yes. Uh, Tom George, you have a question? I think this is the last question. We're running um, an hour and 15 minutes now. Oh, well, I wanna thank you uh, for a great presentation. Uh, it was really enlightening. I just had a couple of comments on the on what a migration. It looks like countries maybe don't want these people, but I'm not sure what they can do to prevent them from coming. Because if the human condition, they're going to get there one way or another, legally or illegally, they'll show up. And with the politics of it, I think there's two things. One, there's an enormous amount of money spent by people like the, the Koch brothers for, who think climate change is really against their economic self-interest. And they'll do anything to, to, uh, to uh, muddy the waters about it. And the other thing is for politicians, if you don't understand a problem, the best thing for you to do is, is to say it doesn't exist. Because once you say it exists, you have to take ownership of it. And then you have to come up with a plan to deal with it. And I think all this is very interesting. And I thank you for a great presentation. Thank you. I really appreciate the comments. You know, especially on the last one, I completely agree. You know, uh, uh, the easiest way to handle something is to just sort of, you know, uh, pretend like it doesn't exist. You're exactly right. right. Um, uh, you know, on the first point, in, in the United States, it's interesting to uh, it's interesting for us to look at other places throughout the world, sort of dealing with uh, uh, inflows of, of of refugees, because we sort of presume, well, you know, um, we have these massive northern and southern borders. Uh, it doesn't matter if we don't want people coming in because they're going to show up one way or the other, you know, regularly or irregularly or otherwise, and so you know that's kind of facts. But something that has been really interesting to see, the, the reason I highlight Europe so much, I think you can see this in the case of Australia, you know, there's plenty of places, in, in the United Kingdom is another good example, there's plenty of places where with enough money, enough resources, and enough coordination, you can prevent people from uh, gaining entry if your border is small and you're surrounded by water, or if the majority of your border is a water border. I mean, you just have to go and look at um, the effect that, um, the EU Libya and the EU Turkey deals have had on refugee inflows into Europe. I mean, the, the there's been a precipitous drop. And so to be sure, you know, people still show up, they get shunted away into refugee camps or deported. Um, but the sort of crisis per se has been uh, uh, the, the actual crisis of actual people showing up has been uh, decreased quite a lot. But of course, there's still the sort of um, this, the social political crisis of being aware that this thing is out there, um, the crisis of politicians and citizens talking about this thing, and therefore keeping it alive and trading on it in a variety of ways. And so, um, uh, uh, you know, my fear, quite frankly, is that uh, governments are going to get better at cooperating or using technology to uh, keep people out, thereby exacerbating a lot of the things that I've talked about. But, but, but anyway, I, I really appreciate the comments. I think uh, they're interesting and spot on. Okay, I think that's the end of our questions, unless Alice Gridley would like to uh, tell us what she had in mind, but she withdrew her hand. Uh, don't see her coming forward, so. Here's Alice. Doug, Doug Mary. <laughs> Oh, Dr. Mary has something. Doug. Here's Alice. Alice, you come in. Yeah. Thank you, Phyllis. Um, I, again, I, I enjoyed the talk, too, very much.
And um, on a small uh, scale, I'm hearing that businesses all across the country because of COVID are looking for help. And at the same time, we're blocking people at the border who would be thrilled to fill those slots. So that's one area that they could look at very quickly. And it would solve some of the problem, not all of it. The other thing is, if you're ever looking for a project for your students, Andrew, uh, you may want to consider a visit to the Baker Detention Center in McClenny. It's only an hour away. And ICE keeps a lot of people there that are most of them are not criminals. Most of them have either had minor infractions or no infractions. And many of them have lived in this country for decades. Uh, I was shocked uh, when I found that out. And there are people who want to work, they wanna be here. So those are areas that I think could use some attention, but I really appreciate that you've opened some doors, I think, for some some people and I, I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks, Alice. I really appreciate it. Um, the the second the second point's a great one. I'll definitely keep it in mind. I think it would be a great uh, a great idea for uh, for students. Um, the first point um, uh, about shutting out people that want to show up here and work. I mean, again, I like all the other points people have made. I think it's a fantastic one. Um, you know, we've heard quite a lot about. Um, uh, 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 you know, staff shortages over the past year or so in a variety of places. But um, what, you know, the sort of elephant in the room that we're not necessarily addressing in many circumstances because it's not politically expedient for lots of people is the fact that, uh, you know, in Gainesville, uh, unemployment is at 3.8%, which is super low. In my home state of Iowa, unemployment is 3%, which is a, you know, a, a decade low, basically. Um, it's not like there's mass unemployment. I mean, there, there is actually mass employment. We're basically at full employment. Um, but I think COVID just, and look, I'm not an expert on this. this these are just my feelings and thoughts. But, you know, COVID has just uh, uh, made people realize that, uh, you know, e all, all sort of even low skill jobs aren't created equal. You know, why, you know, why would you work doing something uh, why would you do job A um, for less money and no benefits when you could do job B for more money and benefits? And in fact, um, I think this is going back to the previous uh, 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 commenter who, who brought up the Koch brothers. This is sort of an interesting thing that I don't, a lot of people don't realize about um, uh, the American right. You know, it's, it's sort of fragmented in a lot of really interesting ways. So uh, the Charles Koch Foundation, where while it might stand for lots of, you know, it might have policy positions that lots of people, you know, in this room maybe might disagree with a, with regards to climate change on migration, um, they're actually much more in line with Alice's point that, you know, uh, uh, if we have, you know, if we have excess uh, 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 jobs here and we can't fill them, we should bring people in. And in fact, that's why people like the Koch brothers, these sort of economic libertarians who really love the free market, that love of the free market carries through to international migration. So, you know, perhaps, par you know, paradoxically, they would agree with you. But again, uh, um, uh, as we sort of move towards whatever the next stage of American life looks like in the next year or so, I mean, I think this is a of an issue that's going to become even more pressing as we try to deal with some of these challenges. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. So our, our last question from Doug Mary, Dr. Mary. <clears throat> thank you. And thank you for a great presentation. It's nice to see a fellow social scientist um, tackling these issues and not leave them only to the other kind of scientists. Speaking as an anthropologist, I was going, I was, going to push back a little bit on your optimism that countries with oceans and seas and so on can resist immigration by climate refugees. I think the pressures are going to build up to such a degree that at the moment, perhaps Europe is relatively successful, not always using very nice means. Same with Australia. And the US. And the US. But it's going to it's it's going to build up the pressure and break uh, the the 
<clears throat> a dike anyway. And to me, the only, there's no short-term solutions, but the only longer-term solution is for the rich countries, hopefully someday led properly by the United States, to really invest in building the capacities of poorer countries to give people jobs to adapt to the impacts of climate change, changes in rainfall and so on. And until, to me, that's the key thing. It's not that, <clears throat> well, let me put it this way. If you go to West Africa, for example, and we see all these coups now, which could probably be related to impacts of climate change because populations are being displaced, herders versus farmers and, and so on. If we were to really succeed in helping those countries build up um, effective institutions, eventually people will stay there and prosper. But it's not a short-term thing, it's a long-term thing. And we're really at a very early stage and we're way under investing. Yes, I, good Thanks. point. Oh, I, I really appreciate it. I and, mean, you know, I, th I think we, uh, I think we def I think we definitely agree on a lot of that. And in fact, you know, your latter point on, you know, building up the institutions of, uh, you know, the institutions and in, uh, state capacity and capabilities of places like in sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, it sort of gets to, you know, one of the things that I tackled in, uh, in my book that's coming out in July, you know, about how uh, uh, Anglo-European uh, imperialism, mostly European and Africa, of course, actually, you know, the effect that that had on uh, the institutions uh, in these places in the global south. But that's neither here nor there. I really appreciate uh, the comment, and I think it's well said. Okay, well, thank you so much, everyone, and especially Dr. Rosenberg. We really, this was a very, as you can see by the response, uh, and questions and discussions. Thank you very much. Very much appreciated uh, talk. Thank you. Thanks you hope, so much. I hope we can uh, hear you again someta sometime. Absolutely, just right. And um, you know, good luck with the rest of the the series. You know, I'm really enthusiastic about what you all are doing. Thank you.